Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the UV Secure webinar uh, covering customer IAM 101. Uh, this afternoon, it's myself, uh, John Jalama, uh, Director of Product Management here at UV Secure, and Petri Ehelainen, the VP of Marketing and Mobile Services. Um, we'll, the listeners will be on mute until the end of this uh, short presentation, but uh, feel free to ask questions on uh, the question text bar within, within the webinar tool, and we'll, we'll answer them right at the end of the question. Uh, for the purpose of today's chat, I'm going to play the devil's advocate. Um, the, the core of the agenda is presented here. We have just a few slides to go through with you. And what I'd like to understand from Petri uh, is uh, four uh, core or the very simplistic kinds of things. The, the first element is the functional title. What is CIAM? So is it customer IAM or consumer IAM? Or what's the difference? Because I've seen it defined as both. Um, the second question is, why isn't my existing internal and access management service enough to do all this? The third question is, who or what kind of organizations are uh, positioned to benefit from CIM? And the fourth question is, how can a service like UbiSecure help me uh, help me with my company's GDPR compliance initiatives. Yeah. So four, four fairly straightforward forward questions, um, but that are oftentimes confusing or uh, confusable for people who aren't working actively in the CIEM space. So the first question is really uh, at, at the core, at the at the foundation of all of this class. Um, CIM, what does the abbreviation mean? Is it consumer or is it for a business customer? Um, can a single term or abbreviation have more than one meaning? And how does UbiSecure see CIM anyway? Petri, can you help clear this up for me? Yeah, that's a uh, good devilish uh, question. So <clears throat> what we see uh, being in the industry is that uh, the uh, abbreviation CIM is, is used uh, both to describe a uh, consumer IM solution and a uh, customer IM solution. And uh, <clears throat> both of them are in a sense uh, correct, but it's uh, dependent on your own viewpoint, what you're trying to uh, achieve or what you are wishing to for example, provide to your own customers. So uh, there are definitely differences between the consumer IAM and uh, uh, you know customer IAM. Uh, if you consider a uh, consumer use case, uh, you have uh, frequencies uh, that are different from. Uh, uh, let's say customer I am that includes also business customers. So as you see from the picture on the page, uh, there's the uh, B2B to C text. And uh, our view is that a uh, customer I am solution uh, addresses both needs. So it's uh, both B2B and B2C uh, solution. Uh, in consumer IM, if we uh, think about the existing solutions, it's mostly about, you know, just social logging, integrating social login to your online website to convert visitors to some kind of identity that you can track and uh, <clears throat> target uh, later on. And it's also a very good conversion tool, uh, no doubt about it. It's easy for the end users, convenient because they can use something that they use daily uh, and uh, Consumer use cases, very, very uh, good option to uh, increase uh, conversion and registration rates. But it doesn't really work for the uh, business customers. So when we consider the differences between consumer and uh, let's say business to business uh, cases, uh, we 
tend to have uh, additional avenues for registration, for example, for business customers. Uh, normally, in a uh, business case, you can end up uh, approving or conducting transactions that are highly valuable, like uh, let's say 100,000 euros. And uh, those are not present in a consumer uh, case, not usually at least. Uh, I haven't done any kind of transactions uh, worth uh, 100,000 euros as a consumer, but in the business world, that is uh, fairly common. And uh, also the difference between where you operate from differs from the business customer and uh, consumer customer. Usually the business customer is operating from within their own corporate networks, whereas the consumer customer, well, they don't usually have or run their own network infrastructure at all. Then uh, one considerable difference between a business to business and business to consumer cases is that uh, if you have a corporate customer and you have uh, several users within that customer organization that are using your services. The changes inside your customer organization are rapid and they are constantly changing uh, employees, roles changed and so on and so forth. But in a consumer world, uh, you don't end being you. Your address may be changed, changed or uh, phone numbers and stuff like that, but you still be the same you till the end of days. So <clears throat> one thing also to know is that uh, in the corporate world, roles are fairly important, but roles in a sense are not present in the uh, consumer uh, world in that sense. You may have a, uh, a unit that is a family, and then there might be roles associated with that. But in the corporate world, those roles and hierarchies are much more present. And the idea is to be able to describe these kind of relationships within the IAM solution. So there's uh, plenty of differences between consumer uh, and customer IAM. How we see it is that actually the customer IAM as a term CIM is both uh, business to business and business to consumer uh, IAM. So uh, from our perspective, we're doing both and later on we'll show uh, some of the uh, customer cases to underline the fact that uh, both business to business and business to consumer cases are uh, valid for customer IAM. OK, that, that makes a lot of sense to, to me now. I mean, uh, business to business is, is consumer IAM. Uh, no, wait, business to business is customer IAM. And B2C, B2C is the consumer side. So I can both be John and go out uh, working in the world or using my identity um, to sign on to my bank. And I can be uh, John as director at Ubisecure and perform functions within the business. So my Ubisecure identity uh, could be used uh, for B2B to C uh, activities. Uh, that, that sounds fantastic. Um, why, why wouldn't, I mean, if we can do that here at, at, at Ubisecure, why, why wouldn't I just, uh, if I wasn't working here at Ubisecure, well, why wouldn't I just use the same identity and access management service that, that I already have from my employees? Is, isn't that enough? Isn't that sufficient? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> what we're talking about here is a, uh, the difference between uh, legacy IAM and uh, customer, customer IAM. Uh, if you show this uh, picture to any of your IT admins or IT people who are involved 
in the management of the internal IAM of your company. They see that immediately and uh, they feel familiar with this picture. So in the internal IAM, the process is mostly driven by the HR process. A person comes into the company as an employee, uh, the data is recorded into the HR system and then provisioned uh, to target applications and of course the internal uh, data repositories like uh, Active Directory. But this same process is not really uh, suitable for the external users. And one key thing is that, uh, well, you don't want to, in most cases, you don't want to store external identity data inside your internal Active Directory environment. But it's more about processes. So the internal IAM is working with a set of uh, internal processes. Apologies, folks. We, uh, we dropped signal for, for a second or two. Where were we? Uh, yeah, the external users and the processes, how you uh, handle them uh, are different from the internal processes. And I was talking about the having the AD password and getting access to, uh, you know, uh, all the target applications inside your organization, hopefully with a single sign on. But with the external users, uh, that's not really the case because the external users have uh, multiple different kind of uh, authentication tools or identities that they can use. So they have social media, they could have bank IDs, they could have their mobile IDs, they could have mobile connect IDs, which are a bit different. But the point is they have already existing IDs. And one thing that you don't want to do is to force them to use another passwords another password uh, for your online services. But more importantly, uh, the processes that support the end users are usually self-service uh, things. So if you have an online site and you have a uh, custom service desk where you, people are uh, forced to call when they, for example, want to uh, reset the password or need to change something, uh, add a uh, something to their account and so on and so forth, you are generating a lot of cost and very much inconvenience for your end customers. Fortunately, nowadays, uh, the modern uh, online services do support and have uh, self-services, but are they all in line with each other? So let's say, for example, you are operating in a couple of different verticals. So you have different business units and they have developed their own online services. Is that sensible if uh, the customer has to create three different accounts uh, for each service and uh, add the same information so that these uh, business line services are not talking to each other at all? It's definitely not, not in line uh, with the uh, idea of uh, GDPR which we come back to uh, later. Uh, but the point is that uh, internal IAM due to the process reasons is a bit, you know, different from the uh, external environment that your customers are living in. And uh, would you now change the, the uh, slides? Uh, so that I can show you the uh, solution? Certainly, certainly can do. So what we do here, uh, or what the uh, CIM is actually doing, is handing out a lot of the control to your customers. And I'm not talking about uh, just the individual, but I'm talking about an organization. So. Uh, this is mostly about uh, business to business uh, use case here, what I'm talking about now. Uh, the idea is that uh, <clears throat> when you onboard a customer, you usually record that information into your CRM. That's your uh, 
let's say, master data for the uh, for the uh, contract information. What a uh, proper uh, customer IM solution should be able to do is to link to that contract information and automate uh, quite a few uh, processes for your organization. So, for example, the customer gets created in the uh, CRM. Now, what you can do or what your sales managers can do is to invite this customer to start using your online services directly from the uh, CRM interface. So they are using Salesforce and they see that, okay, now the uh, customer data has been updated, it's in Salesforce, I'll just click this button and invite this organization uh, to use our online services. And the invite gets sent out to the contact person of your customer organization. And then the control is basically handed to your customer organization. The person that receives the invite is usually the named uh, contact person in your Salesforce data. And uh, <clears throat> he or she can then uh, invite new employees to use your services. He or she can authorize uh, those employees to correct roles. So if you have, let's say, two, three different kind of services that you're offering to your customers, the chances are that uh, you are or you would like to have information on what kind of uh, roles the people coming into using your online services are uh, assigned. So that in the CIM context, that means that the uh, contact person in your customer organization can assign these business roles of your online application or service to the employees and even to uh, external organizations. We have uh, uh, one particular large use case where uh, customer organizations can uh, authorize other companies to represent them in the uh, application. A good example is a, uh, an outsourced service like uh, accountant. So uh, let's say uh, small to medium sized companies might not have their own accounting departments, but they, need, they do need um, someone to take a look at the books and uh, so on and so forth. So they can authorize an accounting company to represent them in a, uh, for example, a tax admin service. One of our uh, cases where actually the uh, customer IAM platform that we today have started from. And it's also about uh, providing flexibility uh, to your customers. Like I said, they may have existing identities and uh, you should be able to provide them with something that they already have because that lessens the threshold to adopt or acquire your services. And this is mostly uh, to consumer side. For the business side, it's very important or let's say it's a competitive edge for you if you allow your customers to single sign on from their own network uh, to your online services and a proper CIM solution just uh, does just that. So your customers, they log in to their own Windows network, they do their stuff and uh, when they need to access your services, they don't have to log in again, they just uh, click link on their intranet page that is uh, direct, you know, link to your services and single sign on uh, from there with the role information attached. For GDPR, this is also important because uh, when you allow your customers to have access to their information and manage the information properly, you give them the 360 view of the personal data. So they can easily modify the information and so on and so forth including even the uh, authentication methods uh, that they prefer to use. So, so do I understand it correctly that UbiSecure CIM would allow me to better engage and serve 
my external business partners as well as end consumers? How, how, this sounds pretty complex still to me. Do, do you actually have any examples you can you can help talk me through? Yeah, sure. Uh, it sounds complex and underneath, under the bonnet, it might actually be. Uh, so it, it's not easy to create a, a customer IM solution from scratch. So uh, if you're thinking about, you know, uh, well, let's put some open source libraries together and uh, we have a uh, working solution, maybe, but we've been doing this for 10 years and uh, we do, do know that it's uh, fairly bit uh, complex underneath, but to the end users, your customer organizations or your consumer customers, your business to business customers, your business to consumer customers, it doesn't have to be, and it's not. And uh, here we have uh, collected uh, a few examples. So, so I, I recognize a few of the logos here. Um, I, I, I see S group, uh, DNA, Meta and and Aditro, um, how would how would you how would you actually uh, tell me where these uh, these businesses fit in Ubisecure's CIM service? How, how do they use it? Yeah, let's go uh, first. Uh, short introduction to uh, to the people who are not familiar with the company. So S Group is a large retail chain. Here in the uh, in the Nordics, if you are outside of the Nordic region, you may associate S Group with, for example, uh, Tesco in the UK. And uh, they the use case here is uh, a business to consumer use case. Uh, they operate uh, in several different verticals. They have uh, grocery stores, supermarkets, uh, department stores. They operate hotels, uh, service stations, they do banking, and uh, even hardware slash uh, agriculture uh, retail. So they have uh, quite a few different uh, kind of things that they do. And those, like, like what I mentioned, like service stations, hotels, they each operate under a, a different brand. And DNA, it's a, a telecom provider. Uh, mobile network operator, uh, also broadband, fiber, and uh, basically the tra traditional telecom uh, service services that uh, you know companies and also consumer customers uh, are using uh, daily. And then we have a, a fairly interesting case, which is the Metsa group. Uh, it's a forestry company that provides uh, different kind of products based on processed uh, materials. And the material, main material that they use is wood, so forest. Uh, Aritra, oh, sorry, uh, the Metsa is, uh, again, uh, business to business and uh, business to consumer uh, kind of use case, as is uh, DNA. So DNA is both in business and consumer space in terms of the CIM. But then we have the pure business to business uh, customer, which is Aritro. And Aritro is a uh, leading uh, business process as a service company here in the uh, Nordics. And they offer uh, services for uh, companies and uh, also uh, to the uh, government the, in the area of uh, payroll, HR, uh, and financial uh, services. Oh, okay, uh, thank, thanks for that. I mean, that, that does help me to understand uh, both the business to consumer and business to business aspects of, of your example customers. I'm, I'm interested, can, can you help me to understand what the business benefits would be? Um, you know, looking on, looking on the left hand side of, of the slide here, um, I'm, I'm interested in quite a few things like the customer experience um, and, and also security and, and privacy. Could you, could you go into a little bit of, of that? Yeah, absolutely. So these uh, four business benefits that we have uh, listed here, uh, they all apply to all of these four organizations as well, but they might have a, a different emphasis uh, for each different organization. 
Uh, as you can imagine, S Group uh, being a retail organization, they have a fairly large uh, customer base. Uh, over 1 million uh, digital identities have already been created uh, in their service. And the digital identity and the management of uh, identity information has been absolutely crucial for them to be able to create some of the uh, fairly innovative services that they have. And to my knowledge, uh, S Group is, uh, if not the first, but definitely among the firsts in the world uh, who have introduced a uh, electronic receipt, for example, for their customers. So when you go by your uh, let's say sandwich and a uh, bottle of Coke in your local grocery store and you swipe your loyalty card, you don't have to get the physical receipt anymore. It goes directly to the cloud. And uh, this applies to all of their branches, meaning that uh, if you fill up your gas tank you know, at their service station, swipe your loyalty card, uh, the information goes to the cloud. and. Uh, this creates a complete purchase history uh, for your actions or interactions with this uh, group. And to access this information, they also, of course, they have to have a, a site uh, for their customers, consumer customers. So I can go online and uh, check out my uh, purchase purchases. And uh, not only that, but if I buy a, uh, an appliance, for example, uh, the warranty slips uh, will go automatically uh, to the online site. And I can imagine there are right now a couple of people listening that uh, have lost at least one or two uh, warranty receipts or slips during their lifetime and uh, had to throw a uh, appliance or gadget to the trash because uh, they couldn't prove that uh, the warranty was uh, still valid. But it's also about uh, <clears throat> GDPR. So uh, security and privacy and regulations. Uh, first of all, they do support uh, strong authentication. They, they support social login as well. But uh, in order to get access to the financial information and that kind of stuff, you have to have strong, strong authentication. So they support bank ID and mobile based uh, identities and so forth. <clears throat> but the ability to have all data in one place to be downloadable, that's pure uh, GDPR. Then uh, going over uh, to uh, DNA, they have actually uh, reached the uh, utopia of uh, identity and access management. And they can provide uh, services to both business and consumer customers and using a single identity. So me as an individual, I can buy DNA services to my home, meaning for example, uh, pay TV or something like that or broadband, but I'm acting as a consumer. But at the same time, using the same identity, I can go on and to the uh, uh, business portal and uh, let's say, for example, buy a new phone, uh, if I'm authorized properly, uh, from their business portal. And they make the distinction between the capabilities through roles that are assigned to a individual. So. I have a company issued role and I can buy the phone. And if I'm a consumer customer, I usually don't have a role associated with that, but it might be that, uh, for example, in family cases, there could be a, a role where uh, someone has authorized, like a dad has also authorized a kid uh, to uh, purchase something from, a, from their online store. And this is something that DNA has already achieved. Metsa Group, on the other hand, uh, they created the, the first world's first uh, forest asset management site or online service. So the background is that uh, well, Finland is uh, mostly forest. If you come here, you probably think that uh, all Finns are Ewoks because uh, we might live in the trees because there's trees all around. But that's also a uh, valuable asset. So uh, one hectare of uh, forest equals over 3000 uh, euros when it's cut and uh, sent off to uh, companies like Mekta who produce uh, 
uh, tissue papers and uh, newspaper papers and uh, these kind of uh, products out of the uh, raw material. So they created an online site where forest owners uh, can acquire, for example, caretaking services uh, to their asset. And it's really cru crucial to understand why this is important because 50 years ago, uh, people lived still in the country. Now, everyone also almost lives in the cities. So we are distant from the assets and they can be neglected. And if you neglect an asset, like a, uh, let's say, 100 uh, hectares of forest, you're losing a ton of money. So what they allowed is that uh, owners of these assets uh, can go there, acquire caretaking services, but also sell off their assets based on uh, auctions. So in our case, the most important thing is that uh, they do support authorization within the portal because in a very, let's say, um, many cases, the owners or, or the ownership of the asset has been distributed uh, due time because inheritance and these kind of things. So you might have a uh, 100 uh, plot, 100 hectare plot of forest somewhere in the middle of Finland, which is in the middle of nowhere. And uh, <clears throat> you have, uh, let's say, five different families owning that plot. What the online portal allows them to do is to appoint or authorize one person to conduct the transaction on their behalf. So potentially you can just lay on your couch, log into the service, approve that, okay, this, uh, let's say John, my uh, uncle can handle the transaction and be done with it and just wait for the money to drop into your account. But for the Meta group, that's also important because uh, when they allow this to happen, they can increase the raw material acquisition. And this, is, this has been a really tremendous success for them because they first, after, after the first year of going online, uh, they already acquired 25% of their raw material needs uh, through this online site. But it's also good for the uh, national economy. Like I said, Finland is mostly about forest, and that's a valuable asset for the whole nation. And then we have uh, Aritro, which is a pure uh, business to business use case. And uh, Aritro, like I said, is uh, business uh, services as a service or business processes as a service company. And they operate in the Nordics as well. And uh, they have had some challenges from uh, going from this client server type of thing to the cloud. They've done it uh, successfully, very successfully. And one thing that uh, they said uh, to us was that uh, it, they couldn't have reached uh, GDPR compliance without customer IAM. And now here, here's the basic idea. Uh, when you have a customer IAM solution, you have a, a single point or single service solution where you store, process and manage uh, personal data. And uh, this is the first step towards uh, GDPR compliance. Because if you have separated silos of different kind of uh, applications, like uh, if Aditor would have a, a different set of, uh, you know, identity data for their HR service or different set of, uh, identity data for their uh, payroll service, it would be a nightmare. But when they have all this identity data handled and managed through a, a single solution, GDPR, GDPR compliance uh, is not a big deal. And <clears throat> an interesting case for the auditor is as uh, they can uh, allow their com corporate customers to single sign on to auditor services from their own corporate networks. A key key feature in a good uh, CIM solution as well. And I think uh, that's more or less what I wanted to say about the uh, example cases. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks, Petri, for, for presenting uh, both why my in internal existing solution 
uh, isn't ideal uh, for, for working with business to business and business con to consumer uh, elements. I, I, I get it. I, I think I understand why B to B to C and B to G as government to C as myself as a consumer identity management is really important um, to to out outsource and, and utilize a service like yourself. I'm I'm interested in a, in a follow up conversation. I'm sure we'll have them uh, moving forward. Um, at this moment in time, that's the the formal conclusion of the slides. I'd like to uh, thank our listeners to following, for following along uh, with us uh, through the technical hiccups. Sorry about those. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be happy to take any questions that you have. And if we're, if we're missing or if we got disjointed there, we'll uh, come back and, and, and answer any of the things that you like. Yeah, so uh, you, have the, uh, you, you should have the uh, chat option in your uh, code webinar. Uh, toolbar so you can use that to uh, ask questions from us but before you leave i would also like to promote uh, the ubisecure nordic im event which is uh, on may 24th you can see the link in on this uh, page here so go there check out the agenda because this is the first of its kind and there's going to be you know fantastic keynote speakers from uh, global identity influencers, top 100 global identity influencers, and uh, interesting topics around GDPR and uh, other uh, issues related to uh, customer IM. But yeah, any questions? We'll give it a moment or two here, if, uh, and if you have questions that you'd like to tap, uh, type into the chat bar, If there aren't any questions, you can, of course, still find uh, both Petri and myself via the standard, uh, uh, the standard email services if you go to look at uh, ubisecure.com. So feel free to uh, reach out to us in an offline capacity if you, if you don't want your question answered here in, in a public capacity. Okay. Do we have one coming in? Yeah, we have a couple. Of, okay. uh, let's see. So we have a question. How do you integrate your single customer IM system that contains all of your customer data with the various aspects of uh, your digital estate, community, e-commerce, event ticketing, etc.? So I'll, I'll think uh, I'll, 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 I'll try to answer, answer that one. Uh, integrating the uh, systems like uh, community, e-commerce, event ticketing, usually the platforms support uh, standards. Uh, for authentication and identity management, there are several different standards available. Uh, the, let's say the old users are SAML and uh, VS Federation. Uh, VS Federation is mostly used on Microsoft platforms and SAML is uh, very dominant in the uh, Java application uh, servers. Uh, <clears throat> then the new ones are OAuth, OpenID Connect and uh, OpenID uh, itself and also uh, for mobile it's uh, Mobile Connect. And all of these standards allow us to integrate uh, to the platforms or the applications uh, that are in your organization. If it happens so that uh, you have a, uh, let's say, a platform that is not really supporting any of those, we have also integrated in integration components that you can install into the uh, target application. Let's say your event ticketing system is not using any of these standards, we can provide you the integration component. And what that means is that uh, the CIM solution, which stands in the middle, uh, is integrated to all of these uh, platforms. It will take care of uh, delivering the identity data uh, to the uh, target applications. But more importantly, it also takes care of uh, authorizing them properly uh, to the applications. So your question listed uh, community, e-commerce and event ticketing. And uh, those are 
fairly different services. And I would imagine that uh, the community service requires a set of attributes like uh, name. Mm, I don't know. Do you think of anything else? A, a name or an email potentially. Yeah. And even ticketing system typically uh, requires something more. Maybe if it's uh, internal, uh, it could be like employee number and these kind of things. But the CIM will take care of uh, delivering just the right set of attributes uh, to the uh, to your online service. So we have another question then. Um, it reads, most of the integration methods you describe support authentication authorization, but how do you handle profile information and keep this in, in sync between the different applications? Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I think uh, this is kind of like a, uh, a reminiscent of uh, internal IAM where provisioning is the tool uh, to deliver the identity information to the applications. It's not so uh, with the customer IAM. Uh, in the customer IAM uh, concept, we don't uh, provision, the, provision the identity information to the applications themselves. Instead, uh, the CIM solution will integrate to the data repositories like, uh, let's say, SQL databases, LDAP directories, and so on and so forth and allow uh, your organization to utilize those data repositories and use the CIM as a, uh, a central uh, point where this data is delivered to the applications using the set uh, protocols like SAML and so on and so forth. But the data, the profile information is definitely stored in the S connected SQL or LDAP uh, databases. For example, DNA previously had several different uh, LDAP uh, repositories and a couple of uh, SQL repositories. What they did with our CM is that they started to integrate uh, gradually these uh, different separate identity silos into the CIM system and uh, <clears throat> harmonizing uh, the uh, identity data. And eventually they ended up uh, with the uh, let's say an identity repository where you had only one single identity and personal data per user, be that the consumer or a business customer. Not sure if that, if that answered your question, hopefully it did. And uh, please absolutely do a follow up with, uh, if this wasn't uh, sufficient. All right. We got it. Thank yeah. you for your help. Thank you for asking the questions. Yeah. They, were, they were good ones. Yeah, really good ones. Are there any other questions that the folks have out uh, who, are, who are listening in? There's a, a few people online, so don't, don't be shy. Feel free to ask. Normally 15 seconds is the rule of uh, silence at the, at the end of a webinar. So if there aren't any questions, Coming in here, uh, feel again, feel free to reach out to uh, uh, Petri or myself. Uh, if we don't know the answer, we'll, we'll certainly find the answer out. If there is more technical detail that you're looking for, we'll put you in contact with our sales engineers and or engineering staff to help resolve any of the issues uh, that, that you might have or the questions that you might have. Uh, thank you again for everybody uh, attending. Do apologize for the, for the technical gap in the, in the audio on the screen. Thanks for bearing with us. Hope you have a great afternoon and uh, a happy springtime. Cheers. Cheers.